One thing optometry has been missing is a unified message that explains the importance of eye care. Now, OYE Broadcasting has solved that dilemma. We are very excited to announce the first subscription-based monthly content delivery service that will not only enhance and expand your practice, but elevate the industry. Please visit OYEbroadcasting.com and sign up today. That's OYEbroadcasting.com. With more screen usage and indoor time, Myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day. The first and only FDA-approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age-appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. Welcome back to part two of my interview with Dr. Mark Dunbar. In this episode, Dr. Dunbar discusses glaucoma treatment. If you're new here and you like our interviews, press like, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to get notifications of great new interviews. And please leave comments. Yeah. So l- l- let's talk about normal tension glaucoma to make things even more confusing. The glaucoma is so confusing. We're treating pressure and now. Mm-hmm. We have this whole group of people, maybe a third or you know, even more that have actually on the first visit, their pressure is n- normal, but they actually have glaucoma. And since the only thing we really do to treat glaucoma is lower pressure, and they actually took pressure out of the definition of glaucoma a while ago. So to make things more confusing, let's talk about normal tension glaucoma. So so we still use that term normal tension glaucoma. So again, for those who who aren't familiar to to our kind of eye world, you know, in in the 50s and 60s and 70s, right? There was this almost an arbitrary cutoff of of a pressure, the normal being up to 20 or 21. And so if you had glaucoma, if it was 25 or 26 or even 21, you had kind of traditional primary open angle glaucoma, but but it was recognized that you would have, you could have glaucoma at a normal pressure. And so, so what the consensus or the experts at that time did coin this term glaucoma that occurs at a normal pressure, normal pressure glaucoma. and, and as time has gone on, really, you know, through the 90s and 2000s and where we are today, we, we realize there is no cutoff between normal tension and, and high tension or high pressure glaucoma. It's really a spectrum of, of really the same disease. And, and there may be different factors, as we've just kind of alluded to in this discussion on what may predispose somebody from developing glaucoma. So the patient who has, quote, normal pressure, but either low perfusion pressure or other factors that may contribute. So, so we still say normal tension, but but it really is a definition that's falling out of favor. And, and, and the fact is, I think it's recognized that it is an extension really of the same disease. Now, along with normal tension, what, you, you probably need to also talk about, you know, neurologic factors. So, so pre- glaucoma that occurs at a, at, a, at a normal pressure, or what's thought to be glaucoma that occurs at a normal pressure, can also maybe there's, there's masquerading conditions, whether it might be a brain tumor or an aneurysm or ischemic events that may have occurred. So, so just because what you have what looks like is glaucoma or a, a pale or a cup nerve isn't necessarily glaucoma. So I think, you know, when we talk about normal tension or glaucoma in the traditional sense, um, you know, the, 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 the optic nerve has a characteristic appearance. It may have a big cup. There may be notching or thinning. And again, just a very characteristic appearance of a nerve that suggests glaucoma. Again, as I said, there's other things, ischemic events, compressive tumors, those type of things that that may look like glaucoma, but isn't, but often the optic nerve will look different in appearance. But again, that's part of the eye care provider's job to, to again, recognize some of those differences, make those distinctions, and if necessary, you know, order neuroimaging, send the patient to a neurologist or a neuro-ophthalmologist or what have you. But to point here, it's really an extension of really the same disease. And I think this is a good, uh, to, you know, bring to bring kind of bring back the discussion because it is associated with migraines and sleep apnea and we'll, and we'll see those little, those little hemorrhages because, and blo- low blood pressure. So yep. there's blood flow issues in, uh, in normal tension glaucoma. Yep. No, I, I think that's exactly right. You know, and, and again, it's just, you know, kind of talks about how, you know, we, we don't really completely understand the disease, but we understand more factors, as you just alluded to, blood pressure, cerebrospinal fluid pressure, perfusion pressure, uh, and those type of things. Yeah. And these people are at greater risk for uh, heart attacks and strokes, 
So it's a very, you know, the eye bone is connected to the toe bone, you know, things that are yeah. kind of all related to each other. So let's talk about some of the tests we do to help diagnose glaucoma. And you talked about OCT before, kind of explain OCT and how do you use OCT in glaucoma? So an OCT, which stands for optical coherence tomography, um, essentially you, you take a scan of the optic nerve and, and, and it's almost like a, a live biopsy, right? So they're able to take a histologic scan of the optic nerve and, and, and what the machine does is essentially compares your scan to a, a, a normal, a normative database, a normal population. Um, so all these instruments, for the most part, will have scanned, I would say, thousands of optic nerves, but in age match normals, it's probably not thousands, it's more like hundreds. And so they give you a probability. What is the probability that based on this nerve configuration, it's, it's normal? compared to this normal population that they scanned. And so, so the, the instrument does a very good job of identifying abnormal nerves. And again, in the setting of somebody who has a suspicious or a glaucomatous nerve, large cup, vertical notching, thinning, those type of things, you know, there's a direct correlation. So, so the OCT has really been really a kind of a critical tool, um, as well as, of course, we, we do a visual field, a threshold test, mapping out a patient's side vision and, and, we, as we've kind of talked about earlier, you can have early glaucoma, you may have a little bit of side vision problems that may go completely unrecognized or unnoticeable unless you do the test. And so measuring a pressure, you know, looking at the optic nerve on, in an exam, doing a visual field, mapping out a side vision, and then doing a scan like an OCT. Those are really kind of the hallmarks that, that pretty much every eye care provider would do, you know, for any patient who is walking in whether you do it as a screening tool or whether you're doing it because you think this may pa this patient may have a higher risk uh, or a susceptibility to glaucoma. Do you do any other advanced testing such as advanced color vision, uh, eye not, kinetics, looking at the pupils, uh, that new eye kinetics instrument, anything like that at Baskin? We, we don't do corneal hysteresis. So that's looking at kind of how rigid, you know, how soft or how rigid, how pliable the cornea is. Again, we talked about measuring pressure. Um, and, and if you have a thick cornea or a very rigid cornea, your pressure may be different than if you have a cornea that's more pliable, like, like, like a trampoline, if you will. And, and, and we don't, um, for whatever reason, I'm not sure. Um, we don't do electrodiagnostic testing in a traditional glaucoma setting, because I don't think it adds any more information that, than what we have for the other testing. Just like you know, sensitive color vision testing. We, we don't. We, we do those maybe in a setting of, of, of a neurologic condition. But again, I, I don't think the time that's spent to do additional tests, I think there's a low yield on it providing any more information than really what you need from these kind of key four tests that we just talked about. Let's talk about medical management and the different types of medication used. Let's start with the prostaglandins. You know, P patients that are on glaucoma are familiar with latanoprost and tra the old Travitan and Lumigan. And now we have a new kid on the block by Zolta. But you could talk about prostaglandins. So, so again, you and I started around the same time. And, and you know, when we would treat glaucoma in the 80s and 90s, we didn't really have a lot of options. Uh, we had the beta blockers, uh, Timolol being the number one prescribed glaucoma medication almost ever. And essentially what that did is it would kind of turn down the faucet, right? So you weren't producing as much fluid in the eye. And the, and the other drop or the other drops that we had at the time, there's one called pilocarpine where it constricts your pupil. Um, so you get a brow ache, a headache, but it would facilitate the flow of the fluid out of the eye. The downside of pilocarpine was that it was four times a day, right? So the burden of treatment would, would be four times a day with this meiotic pupil that would affect your night vision, et cetera. Then the third one was, was, was propene, which again, also worked to lower pressure, but many patients would develop red eyes. So, so beginning in the 90s was really this explosion of, of new medications. There's these prostaglandins, if you will, they're essentially mediators of inflammation. Um, but what they found was, at a low dose, taking it once a day, it would kind of facilitate the outflow, if you will. It would, it would different ways to kind of get the, the fluid out of the eye. And, and they quickly, they were, became the most powerful drops that we had, really the most effective drops. And, and the beauty of that was 
you only needed to use it one time a day at night. So that in and of itself was a game changer because we had an effective, powerful medication that was well tolerated. And in combination with maybe using a beta blocker, we could get, you know, 40, 50 percent or more IOP intraocular pressure lowering. And then since then, we've, you know, we've had some combination medications. So medications, you know, two bottle or two medications combined with one bottle. And, and, and those have worked very well. Um, and then there's kind of a, a, kind of the latest are these kind of these, these rock inhibitors. Um, and, and again, just a, a different modality of, of trying to lower the pressure. Um, so, so we've got at our disposal in, in different formulations of prostaglandin, you talked about Visolta. So we've got non, non-preserved latanoprost. We've got latanoprost that's bound to this nitrous oxide molecule. So molecules that we've used, but, but really formulating them in a way to really get the maximal benefit of, of lowering the pressure. You think um, you get any more benefit by with 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 a uh, a, a Visolta type? Well, I, you know, more? you know, theoretically, yes, I, I I do. You probably get an extra millimeter or two. Here's the problem, right? So this is kind of where I'm going with this. We've got, you know, at our disposal, I think incredible pressure lowering medications that that make it easier for the patient in terms of being able to take a drop, you know, or a less number of drops. The downside is we are now slaves to the insurance companies and formulary. So we've got these great medications that are that are that, that are available, but it becomes almost cost prohibitive for our patients to get them. So Visalta, for example, it requires a prior authorization. You know, you're looking at this branded medication that is uniquely compounded that works to lower the pressure, but does it work better or significantly better than what says now? The generic equivalent that maybe two or three or four dollars for patients versus you know if they're having to pay fifty or sixty dollars and so the question that we ask as providers is this drop that much better where I think the patient needs to be on it and sometimes the answer is yes I do think because I think it's a better drop or you know I know it's not going to be approved but now I got to do a prior authorization we've got to jump through the hurdles that the insurance company is making us jump through to get this medication approved so. It's unfortunate because I do think we have better, more potent medications available now, but it becomes a much harder task, you know, for the provider, the eye care provider to try to get these medications in the hands of our patients. And it's, and it's very, very frustrating to me. Uh, so I'm still probably 80% of my medications are the same medications that we've used 10, 15 years ago. They work, they work fine. But, but again, you'd love to be able to have, you know, some of these newer medications at your disposal to, to try to work. But again, if you're looking at, you know, a Medicaid patient or, you know, lower income patient or whatever, you know, it, it becomes, it's a tough ask sometimes for our patients. With these prostaglandin medications, the Lumigans, the Travitans, the, the Visaltas, what are some of the side effects uh, uh, that you find, the Thanoprost, what, what are some of the side effects that you find? So um, initially you, the eye may be a little bit red, right? Um, a little bit, but that's not a game changer. And that typically goes away. Um, the biggest thing, of course, is eyelash growth. Lashes become thicker, darker, longer. And so Allergan has kind of looked at that and they took Lumigan and marketed it. They really didn't even change the formulation. They just kind of changed the brand and label on the bottle. It went through FDA approval, of course, but this is a drop now that we use predominantly in females to get longer, thicker eyelashes. So if you're a male, maybe you don't want longer eyelashes, or if you have glaucoma in one eye, and I'm going to put the drop in one eye, you don't want to have one eye that's got these thick, long lashes compared to the other ones, right? So that, depending on your perspective, may or may not be a, a side effect you want. Um, they cause some increased pigmentation to the periocular tissue. So if you use them over time, you know, your lid margins can get a little bit darker. Sometimes they can get a little red. And then maybe the biggest one, in, in a certain subset of people with maybe more hazel irises, it can change the eye color. Again, wouldn't do it in a blue iris, wouldn't do it in, in a brown iris, probably wouldn't do it in a green iris, but in somebody who's got more of a hazel color, it can, it can change the, the eye color. And, and so again, you know, I had a, a lady just a couple of weeks ago who had beautiful blue eyes and we were going to put her on Latanoprost and, and, and she was very astute and said, listen, I, 
is this a drop that's going to change the color of my irises? Actually, I had a male do that too, interestingly, same color irises. And so I go, well, the risk is very, very low. You know, this is, remember, a patient in their 60s, 70s, maybe 80s, do you really, of course, we all care, but it, I think it becomes less of an issue if you're looking at somebody in their 20s and 30s and 40s, right? But but the lady came back, and even though I told her, assured her it wouldn't change her iris color, she said, listen, I, I don't want to go on this drop. And so we put her on, on Timolol, a beta blocker. The guy had had no problem. So that's really the main side effects with, with the, with the, with the prostaglandin drops is, and, and I think they're, they're minimal. I don't think they're really a significant barrier, but I think you need to be aware of, they can cause the orbital fat to kind of shrink. So again, you think of about a 40 year old patient who you're going to put on this drop. And, and if they're going to be on it for the next 20 years, you know, they may get some in ophthalmos. They may get some, you know, not shrinkage, but right. They, they may, their eyes may go in a little bit and, 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 and that, you know, you don't think about what's going to, what it's going to look like 20 years from now in, in somebody who's 80 years old, but in somebody who's 40 years old, I think you, you have to take that into consideration. One thing optometry has been missing is a unified message that explains the importance of eye care. Now, OIE Broadcasting has solved that dilemma. We are very excited to announce the first subscription-based monthly content delivery service that will not only enhance and expand your practice, but elevate the industry. Please visit oiebroadcasting.com and sign up today. That's oiebroadcasting.com. And how, we talked about beta blockers. You know, the common one is Tim Optic, the yellow yep. cap. How about some of the side effects to that? So the beta blockers will, the nature of what they do is they slow the heart rate, right? So, um, and, and, and they may affect breathing. So somebody who has asthma or obstructive pulmonary disease, a beta blocker is a contraindication. Um, and then keeping in mind that the two most common, the most commonly prescribed combination medications are combined with a beta blocker, um, COSOPT and, and COMBAGAN. Um, and so, you know, we have you know, the, as a beta blocker, it's, it's used quite a bit. And so the biggest thing is you, you want to make sure you don't use it in somebody who's got obstructive pulmonary disease, asthma, those type of things. And, 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 and it does get used, you know, we'll have patients that, boy, you know, I noticed I'm having trouble breathing and you look and, and maybe you didn't think to ask, or maybe when you prescribed it five years ago, they didn't have a problem, but as they've gotten older, their, their pulmonary issues have become kind of more of an issue. And then you look at, gosh, look, if we stop the beta blocker, will this, will this help them? So yeah, it's a significant one. There's a stat I read, and this was when Timolol came out in the 1970s, over a period of about five to seven years, 32 people died as a result of being put on Timolol. All right. So, so again, we first got it, maybe people were not you know, it was just so easy to use. They weren't aware. And again, did they really die because they were put on Tim? I mean, I don't know, but, but that is a stat that's always in the back of my mind that I think about when I'm putting a patient on, on a medication like Tim along. That brings up a point. Do you think we have to be more careful in patients who are post COVID keeping them on a, a beta blocker? You know what? I had not thought about that until you just brought it up. You know, as I think about it, yeah, I think you have to think about it. Absolutely. You know, how much return to lung function do they have? Uh, and again, it may be normal, but you put them on a beta blocker and then, so yeah, that may be a question that we're going to start to need to ask our patients. Did you have COVID and did you have significant breathing? Did you, were, were you put on a ventilator? And let's talk about the alpha agonists, you know, such as alpha GAN. Uh, yep. How do they work and what are some of the side effects that people have to look out for? So, so alpha GAN, again, I think it, it, it facilitates, you know, uh, outflow. It, it's an it's a sympathomimetic, so it's a, um, it'll cause whitening of the eye. It may cause a little bit of pupil dilation, a um, little, little bit. Um, you know, the, the, again, I, it just doesn't have quite the potency that a, 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 a prostaglandin or a beta blocker would, maybe 20%. So again, if you need that extra little bit, the, the biggest thing, again, is kind of like the visine drops, right? If you use visine long enough, patients will develop a hypersensitivity to it and it'll make the eye more red. Uh, and when, when alpha-GAN or bromonidine first came out, the way it was formulated, it was a higher concentration. So we were seeing, you know, some bromonidine reactions or allergies, uh, maybe up to 25% of people, if you're using it long enough, may develop this hypersensitivity to it. 
Um, so it, again, it's something to be aware of. Now, again, I, I guess I'll qualify this. I do consulting work for Allergan. Um, you know, they would tell you that if you're going to prescribe alpha gannabramonidine, do the 0.1. I, I think for good reasons, right? The lower the concentration of the molecule, I think we can limit you know, their risk of developing a bromonidine allergy, because unfortunately, once you develop an allergy to that molecule, it really takes the combination drugs off, off as an option, right? I'm not going to prescribe COSOP. I'm not going to prescribe uh, Combigan. These are combination medications that have either Timolol plus, you know, Combigan has, has that higher concentration of, of bromonidine. So, so I think you have to be aware, you know, and, and I think it's a reason that if you want to put a patient on a bromonidine, make sure it's the alpha gan P, the lower concentration, because I think the risk of developing hypersensitivity to that drop is, is much less. And how about the carbonic and hydrates inhibitors? You know, the true SOPs, the ASOPs of the world. Uh, um, so the carbonic and hydrates inhibitors also kind of increase outflow. Um, you know, they were originally prescribed by mouth. Acetazolamide, it increased, you know, it you know, it makes you urinate more, right? And 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 so it it, it does lower the intraocular pressure uh, that way. And so you know, these are what probably in the 1990s they were formulated in in an eye drop, um, and and they work very well, right? So so we use them, we use them in combination. I would kind of put it as a, almost like an alpha gan or bromonidine category. They're not as potent as some of the others. They're a good adjunct. They're good in combination with another drop. So, so we use them, they, you know, they, they, they work well, but again, I think it's more second, third line therapy um, today. And how about the role kinase inhibitors? You mentioned them before, the Ropressa, the Roclitans. Uh, when do you guys use that? And what have been, what's your experience been? So, you know, the, the role kinase inhibitors, again, increase uveal scleral outflow, just another way to kind of and in, in increase outflow in general. So, so a completely different molecule, a, really a completely different path. Um, you know, rokinase in general, probably not the best, but when you, when you kind of combine it with, with latanoprost, when you combine it with a, a prostaglandin, all of a sudden, I think it, it is a very powerful um, IOP lowering medication. So again, it, it is probably the most potent, perhaps the most potent combination medication that we have. Unfortunately, um, again, it, it's difficult to prescribe just because of formulation, pharma, uh, formulary issues. And again, the downside is that it probably causes more redness than the other drops. So, you know, hyperemia is, is really a big issue. That hyperemia is supposed to, you know, get better as you use it, as your eye kind of adapts to it, maybe within a month, six weeks, the redness will go away. Um, I, I, I've had not great luck prescribing it uh, in, here in South Florida. Um, I've wanted to use it on a lot of people. So again, it really becomes a drop if the COSOPs and COMBAGANs aren't doing it and you want that little extra push. Or again, you're, you, you know, for most of us, maximal medical therapy might be two bottles, three medications, right? Um, you know, if you're just not where you want to be and you want to get that pressure lower, I think this is a good alternative. Or, and, hopefully one day, maybe even a good first line drug, you know, to use a drop once a day that is a combination drop that has the, the power of, of a prostaglandin like latanoprost in combination with, um, with, with rock latana, it, it's very attractive. The redness is a little bit of an issue, but, but again, let's assume patients, most patients will get over that. I find the same thing that, you know, a lot of people get red eyes and they don't tolerate it as well, it does work. It does lower the pressure really good, yep. but unfortunately, some people do get that redness and they don't tolerate it. I have to ask you about this. How about marijuana? We get asked about that <laughs> a lot. It, it works, right? Um, it works. The problem, of course, with with marijuana is the half life is so short um, that you know it'll get an IOP lowering effect, but you know, very you know, 10, 20 minutes, an hour, who knows? But it'll. You know, the effect wears off very quickly. And, and again, I, I remember, you know, when I first started, we had a couple of patients of Baskin Palmer that had bad, bad glaucoma, um, that that was the only thing that would lower their pressure. So, you know, we were involved in petitioning Tallah Tallahassee at the time to, to allow that, you know, for, for, you know, you know, medical use. And, and, and it was now, interestingly, these were the same people who you would picture as 
even if you didn't have glaucoma, you know, this is the eighties, right? They, they were your poster child for being a kind of a marijuana user. So, uh, but, but she also had bad glaucoma. So. So uh, let's uh, very quickly about some of the surgical treatments uh, for glaucoma, you know, SLT filters and MIGs. If you could just review that real quick uh, about the surgical treatments. Sure. You know, so, and I tell all my patients, right? If, if you're somebody who's not good about taking an eye drop, you know, if you just, because you can't remember, you can't get them in, there's, uh, there's other, and, and, you know, sometimes we get mad at our patients when they're not complying or they're not using it, but, but again, it, it's a fact of life, right? So I, I let them listen. We've got, if you're one of those who can't take a drop, we've got other options. And, and again, it may be a laser, like an SLT, a selective laser trabeculoplasty, where, where you can just via a laser, you can laser that drainage and it, and it facilitates the outflow. That's very effective, probably 20, 25, 30% IOP lowering. It's a one-time treatment that theoretically can be repeated, but, but it works very well in lowering pressure. Um, we've now developed techniques at the time of cataract surgery to put maybe a little fistula, we call them stents. So put a little tube in the drainage that in a sense is a direct access for the fluid to drain out of the eye. So again, think of that clogged drain. If we can just kind of drill a hole in the drain and put a little pipe there, you know, that may be a way that we can lower the pressure independent of having to take a drop. And so these are what's called the MIGS, micro-invasive surgical devices. Um, they're, most of them are done at the time of surgery. Again, good success may take the place of one, maybe two drops. There are several companies that have developed them that be, have become FDA approved. So we do a lot of these devices at the time of cataract surgery. And, and again, I think it's been, again, just another tool in our tool belt to, to uh, you know, effectively lower intraocular pressure. So if I have a patient who has glaucoma and I know they have a cataract and maybe I'll send the patient earlier for cataract surgery because I know number one, they'll benefit from the cataract surgery, but number two, we'll be able to put one of these stents in their eye and that will take the place of a, of a medication and, may, and that may be all they, they need to lower the intraocular pressure. And so those are, are those are routinely done. And then you go to really more invasive procedures where you, you create a, a fistula, a, a, a drainage tube, if you will. Um, and those are done really for typically for patients who have more severe forms of glaucoma, right? These are people who have, that we talked about Carrie early on, who have advanced field loss. Maybe they're not compliant. Maybe they come in, you know, late in their disease. They've got scarring in their eye. Maybe it's a patient who has diabetes that's develop bad diabetic retinopathy. And, and because of their diabetes, we're just not effectively able to get the pressure lower, right? So there's, there's surgical ways to create a, a drainage, whether it's via a tube or whether it's creating a filter to drain. Um, so, so those, again, they're, they're, they're effective. They, they work very well, but typically reserved for patients who typically have more advanced glaucoma or patients who are really poorly compliant with glaucoma. So we've got a lot of things in the tool belt, you know, for optometrists, laser in some states, you know, effective eye drops, you know, and if that doesn't do it, we've got, you know, other surgical procedures that are very, very effective and work very well. Anything in the future that you may be working on at Baskin Palmer that you could share with us? You know, I, I think other than just better ways, you know, advance, you know, advancing the surgical techniques, you know, better surgeries, less invasive surgeries, talked about these MIGs, these micro, you know, micro, you know, devices that, that cause less destruction, less starring. You know, I think that's, you know, I think that's kind of where, from what I, you know, know and see is, is really what's going on and really it perfecting the, the, the available techniques. And many patients will ask, is there anything they could do to help prevent them from getting glaucoma or in addition to the drops that they're gonna take, obviously they're not gonna stop taking the drops, but in addition, is there anything they could do to help, you know, more of a, in a natural approach? Yeah, you know, what I tell all my patients, the fact that you're aware of it, that either you're a glaucoma suspect or you have a family history of glaucoma, the biggest thing you can do is making sure it be a reason you come in, whether it's annually, for an ocular hypertensive, maybe twice a year, whatever the case may be, but. But no, I don't think they're, you know, it's not eating green leafy vegetables. It's not taking antioxidants. It's not less workout or more workout. You know, I'm not aware of anything beyond just making sure you come in um, to get your eyes tested, to, to diagnose the disease as early as we can. Uh, I, I think that's really the fundamental principle. 
And then once you have the diagnosis, don't follow, don't get lost to follow up. You know, don't pretend like your disease doesn't exist. Don't let, boy, I can't remember to take a drop or, you know, I'm afraid I'll get yelled at because I haven't taken my drop. That's okay. You know, if you're one of those who can't take a drop, we, we've got other ways to lower the pressure. Well, I think the, the bottom line, it's really important that patients and we not to beat a dead horse, but it's really important that patients come in and get their eyes examined and to get their pressure checked. And it's not only just pressure, but to look at all the different risk factors for glaucoma, because glaucoma could be very devastating. It could be blinding. Again, 10% of the people who are blind in the U.S. have glaucoma. And uh, it's not something to 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 take 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 lightly correct i, I would agree 100 percent. well i want to thank dr mark dunbar uh for joining me today he's certainly a wealth of information he's one of the the greats in optometry and uh if people want to find out more about you how could they do that well they can you know i'm i'm not the best social media guy so you won't find much on social media whether it's facebook Certainly nothing on Twitter, but you know, you certainly can email me if you have any questions, mdunbar at miami.edu. That's M-D-U-N-B-A-R at miami.edu. Um, you know, I'm certainly feel free to reach out. I, I, I need to do a better job of, I guess, promoting myself uh, like others do. It's just, you know, I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> Again, I want to thank Dr. Mark Dunbar for joining me today. And for Open Your Eyes, this is Dr. Kerry Gell. Please, everybody stay well. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner, not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e-learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.